1930, the Republican-controlled House of Representatives, in an effort to alleviate the effects of the, anyone, anyone, the Great Depression, passed the, anyone, anyone, the tariff bill, the Holly Smoot Tariff Act, which, anyone raised or lowered, raised tariffs in an effort to collect more revenue for the federal government. Did it work? Anyone? Anyone know the effects? It did not work, and the United States sank deeper into the Great Depression. Today, we have a similar debate over this. Anyone know what this is, class? Anyone? Anyone? Anyone seen this before? The Laffer Curve. Anyone know what this says? It says that at this point on the revenue curve, you will get exactly the same amount of revenue as at this point. This is very controversial. Does anyone know what Vice President Bush called this in 1980? Anyone? Something D-O-O economics. Boredom is the common condition of school teachers, and anyone who has spent time in a teacher's lounge can vouch for the low energy, the whining, the dispirited attitudes, to be found there. When asked why they feel bored, the teachers tend to blame the kids, as you might expect. Who wouldn't get bored teaching students who are rude and interested only in grades? If even that. Of course, teachers are themselves products of the same 12-year compulsory school programs that so thoroughly bore their students. And as school personnel they are trapped inside structures even more rigid than those imposed upon the children. But what if there is no problem with our schools? What if they are the way they are, so expensively flying in the face of common sense and long experience in how children learn things, not because they are doing something wrong, but because they are doing something right? Could it be that our schools are designed to make sure not one of them ever really grows up? Do we really need school? Six classes a day, five days a week nine months a year, for twelve years. Is this deadly routine really necessary? And if so, for what? We have been taught to think of success as synonymous with, or at least dependent upon, schooling, but historically that isn't true in either an intellectual or a financial sense. And plenty of people throughout the world today find a way to educate themselves without resorting to a system of compulsory secondary schools that all too often resemble prisons. Why then do Americans confuse education with just such a system? What exactly is the purpose of our public schools? The great H. L. Mencken, wrote in the American Mercury for April 1924, that the aim of public education is not to fill the young of the species with knowledge and awaken their intelligence. Nothing could be further from the truth. The aim is simply to reduce as many individuals as possible to the same safe level, to breed and train a standardized citizenry, to put down dissent and originality, that is its same in the United States, and that is its same everywhere else. His article goes on to trace the template for the educational system back to the now vanished, though never to be forgotten, military state of Prussia. The United States educational system really is Prussian in origin, and that really is cause for concern. What shocks is that we should so eagerly have adopted one of the very worst aspects of Prussian culture, an educational system deliberately designed to produce mediocre intellects, to hamstring the inner life to deny students appreciable leadership skills, and to ensure docile and incomplete citizens in order to render the populace manageable. It was from James Bryant Conant, president of Harvard for 20 years, World War I poison gas specialist, World War II executive on the atomic bomb project, high commissioner of the American zone in Germany after World War II, and truly one of the most influential figures of the 20th century, that we first got wind of the real purposes of American schooling, Without Conant, we would probably not have the same style and degree of standardized testing that we enjoy today, nor would we be blessed with gargantuan high schools that warehouse 2,000 to 4,000 students at a time, like the famous Columbine High in Littleton, Colorado. In Conant's 1959 book-length essay, The Child, the Parent and the State, he mentions in passing that the modern schools were the result of the revolution engineered between 1905 and 1930. He declines to elaborate. But he does direct the curious to Alexander Ingalls' 1918 book, Principles of Secondary Education. Ingalls makes it perfectly clear that compulsory schooling on this continent was intended to be just what it had been for Russia in the 1820s. Divide children by subject, by age grading, by constant rankings on tests, and by many other more subtle means, and it was unlikely that the ignorant mass of mankind, separated in childhood, 
would ever reintegrate into a dangerous hole. Ingalls breaks down the purpose, the actual purpose, of modern schooling into six basic functions. 1. The adjustive or adaptive function. Schools are to establish fixed habits of reaction to authority. This precludes critical judgment completely. 2. The integrating function. Its intention is to make children as alike as possible. People who conform are predictable, and this is of great use to those who wish to harness and manipulate a large labor force. 3. The diagnostic and directive function. School is meant to determine each student's proper social role. This is done by logging evidence mathematically and anecdotally on cumulative records. As in, your permanent record. 4. The differentiating function. Once their social role has been diagnosed, children are to be sorted by role and trained only so far as their destination in the social machine merits, and not one step further. 5. The selective function. This refers to Darwin's theory of natural selection as applied to what he called the favored races. In short, the idea is to help things along by consciously attempting to improve the breeding stock. Schools are meant to tag the unfit with poor grades and other punishments so that their peers will accept them as inferior and effectively bar them from the reproductive sweepstakes. 6. The propedeutic function. The societal system implied by these rules will require an elite group of caretakers. To that end, a small fraction of the kids will quietly be taught how to manage this continuing project, how to watch over and control a population deliberately dumbed down and ignored, in order that government might proceed unchallenged. That, unfortunately, is the purpose of mandatory public education. Ingalls was hardly alone in championing these ideas. Conant himself, building on the ideas of Horace Mann and others, campaigned tirelessly for an American school system designed along the same lines. Men like George Peabody, who funded the cause of mandatory schooling throughout the South, surely understood that the Prussian system was useful in creating not only a harmless electorate and a servile labor force, but also a virtual herd of mindless consumers. In time a great number of industrial titans came to recognize the enormous profits to be had, by cultivating and tending just such a herd via public education, among them Andrew Carnegie, and John D. Rockefeller. We don't need Karl Marx's conception of a grand warfare between the classes to see that it is in the interest of complex management, economic or political, to dump people down, to demoralize them, to divide them from one another, and to discard them if they don't conform. Woodrow Wilson, then president of Princeton University, said the following to the New York City School Teachers Association in 1909. We want one class of persons to have a liberal education, and we want another class of persons, a very much larger class, of necessity, in every society, to forego the privileges of a liberal education, and fit themselves to perform specific difficult manual tasks. Theorists from Plato to Rousseau to our own Dr. Ingalls knew that if children could be cloistered with other children, stripped of responsibility and independence, encouraged to develop only the trivializing emotions of greed, envy, jealousy, and fear, they would grow older but never truly grow up. Maturity has by now been banished from nearly every aspect of our lives. Easy divorce laws have removed the need to work at relationships, easy credit has removed the need for fiscal self-control, easy entertainment has removed the need to learn to entertain oneself, easy answers have removed the need to ask questions. We have become a nation of children, happy to surrender our judgments and our wills to political exhortations and commercial blandishments that would insult actual adults. We must wake up to what our schools really are, laboratories of experimentation on young minds, drill centers for the habits and attitudes that corporate society demands. Mandatory education serves children only incidentally, its real purpose is to turn them into servants.